Hi, I'm Wendy Stapleton. Welcome to Rock Down, coming to you live from Musicland. And tonight we are paying tribute to Trevor Young, the drummer from, of course, uh, Lobby Lloyd and the Coloured Balls, and and many other bands, Buster Brown and I think Black Feather for a little while. Anyway, uh, tonight we're hoping to hear some fabulous stories honouring Trevor and uh, some wonderful tales about life in rock and roll. So uh, my special guests this evening, the one and only Mike Rudd. Yeah. Gavin Anderson. Yeah. And Dennis Miller. Yeah. And of course, uh, uh, Dennis played with uh, Trev and went to school with Trev. But uh, we thought we'd just start off with a, a sort of an interesting concept the fact that um, when you were playing in the early 70s, um, I think you described your band as psychedelic, sort of hippie-ish, and uh, of course the coloured balls weren't. So can you give us a little <laughs> bit of that? Well, I think you said they were sharpie, sort of rock and roll. Give, give us a bit of a rundown on the difference in, in, in the, the scene at that time. Well, uh, we were a hard-working band and, and of course, the Coloured Balls were... Not. No, no they were a hard-working band as well, but they managed to move in different spheres to us. And um, so our paths rarely crossed in any case. Uh, and, but you could describe uh, the different styles of music as, as poles apart, I guess, even though I, I think... Um, Lobby would have liked to have moved into the hippie, trippy area. He was he was born to be a rock and roller, and and Trevor was definitely uh, he was he was a guy that uh, that uh, drum kits and would uh, beg not to be bought by. They'd be <laughs> quivering in the corner, going, "Don't buy me, Trevor," because <laughs> he he pulverised uh, drum kits and. Uh, Sure, and, and that was his uniform approach to to all the music he played. So I, I actually heard that he was all oh, probably the loudest drummer in Australia, a, a, and with a kit of drums he was as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, strangely enough, as as we were talking about before, you didn't really have any great connection until the nineties. Is that correct? Yeah, well, in the 90s I was uh, I was getting some posters done and he wafted into the into the uh the office and and started with barely an introduction started raving about the internet which I was only vaguely familiar with and and raved at me for about half an hour with great enthusiasm so Sounds thought, like Trevor. <laughs> by the time I uh, by the time I left I thought there must be something going for this internet business and and got stuck into it and then there wasn't really uh, any contact until 2003 when he was putting together his seasons of change. Can you concert. describe what that that was the concept? Uh, yes, well, I'd, um, until Bren reminded me, I'd f forgotten. I thought there must have been some sort of cause behind it. And, of course, there was because uh, he, he was running with a similar manifesto to, to rock down, in a sense, because he really wanted to see Heritage Acts as they are now um, being recognised for what they do now rather than what they did 20, 30 years ago. Uh, which was a really worthy objective, and he put a concert together with with us and uh, some other bands, including uh, Black Feather and probably Madelake, I'm guessing. No, not Madelake. So Black Feather and oh, yeah. Stockley C Mason. No. Yeah, uh, Sam C and Glyn were there. That's right. And um, so uh, he put together that concert and. And that was uh, remarkable for his enthusiasm to get the whole thing going and uh, generate that level of enthusiasm from us old bastards who were hanging around <laughs> waiting for something to be done for them. And, and, and he went ahead and did it. Mind you, I think he ended up with about a thousand DVDs under his bed. But nevertheless, it was a, a worthy thing to do. Well, maybe we can, we can flog them now. Well, indeed, yes. If we can dig them up, we can, uh, we can flog them. Did they? Did they? Oh. Okay. We're meltdown. <laughs> We've rock got our, down, meltdown. Our rock historian over here, um, and sorry, I'll just reiterate that, that evidently, and is that true? 
sadly, yep. all of the, um, the, the oh, well. CDs were burnt, uh, of course, as people probably did here in the uh, Black Saturday bushfires. But he lost his um, Slingerland drum kick that he'd had for years in the, in the fire. And there was a benefit here for exactly that. He had a that. benefit for him as well, too. And uh, Wally Bishop, thank you, Wally, um, found a, another Slingerland drum kit for him. And uh, so he was able to keep going. OK, well, um, somebody who has or had known Trevor since childhood, Dennis, went to school with... That's me. ..with... Um, Trev, so that's right. Tell yeah. us about how, how you actually uh, re-met playing together. Can can I just say firstly that um, I, w one of my first memories of uh, Trevor and drums was uh, back at Hyatt State School. Um, it must have been about 1963. I've worked out uh, because he was a year or two ahead of me at Hyatt State School. Um, uh, he lived in Hyatt, I lived in Cheltenham, but the, the, the state school was on the border, so uh, we attended the same state school. And then we went on to the, 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 the secondary school as well, uh, uh, Sandringham Tech. But they had us, um, one day at Hyatt State School, the, the teachers said, OK, we want you to practice your marching out in the quadrangle. So we all went out there and, and they'd organised Trevor. Um, to uh, tap out the uh, the march beat. Tap or bash? Well, I, I don't think it was as hard as he used to play <laughs> in the coloured balls, for example. But um, I think he must have just been new to drums, perhaps. But um, 1963, he would have been about 12, I think. I would have been about 10 or 11. And, and then I'd heard, you know, like, like in a few years after he'd left, uh, I didn't have much to do with him at uh, Sandringham Tech because I think he left in third form and I started probably the year uh, before he left. So there was only one year. And um, anyway, to cut a long story short, yes, um, we'd both heard about each other getting into music and especially me of him because he was before me and um, he had this band called Blacksy's Babies um, along with uh, another old friend of mine too, uh, Bob Z. Miller, uh, who ended up playing in a couple of balls with him. And um, I saw them play one night um, at uh, the Beau Morris Civic Centre. Um, it used to be called Stonehenge. Do you remember that? Yeah. Stonehenge? Now, I, <laughs> I wasn't allowed to go to Stonehenge. Now, that must have been, was, I think it was about 68 or 69. And I, did, I don't think I really knew that Blacksy's Babies were playing there. They were a support act. Um, I don't know who would have been leading. It might have been Russell Morris or someone like that. But what struck me about it was uh, I walked in and there was Black Sea Babies they were playing. And I um, can't remember exactly what they were playing. But what I do remember was Trevor playing drums. It just stuck out so much. Like he, he just had this whole body style and he hit the drums. Yeah. So and played. you knew it back then. <laughs> And we're over at Music Lane celebrating Trevor Young and I found Mr Music Land himself, Mick, who owns this place and supports live music. And what a celebration we've got of Trevor Young's life tonight. Yeah, nice man. Yeah. It's a shame what's happened. You'll be sadly, sadly missed that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, just a tough player. I've always known him as a tough player and I love playing with man. I've jammed with him only, but wow. Hey, Susie here again, and I've found Rob Teichelman in the audience, and he's celebrating Trevor Young, and we're here at Musicland having a wonderful night. What do you remember about the coloured balls and Trevor Young? A bit of Sharpie movement happening? Oh, absolutely. I grew up on it. Yeah. yeah, doing the old Sharpie dance? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and we've done some few, haven't we? We have, we have. <laughs> we've been out and about and danced to uh, some Sharpie numbers, mm -hmm. and that's what Trevor Young was known for in the coloured balls. Yes, Yep, you reckon absolutely. you could show me a couple of Sharpie moves? What was your favourite coloured ball song? Uh, Liberation Rock. Oh, uh, yeah? Yeah. Right. Let's do it. Come on. Yeah. Come on.
<laughs> uh, welcome back to Rock Down. Um, tonight we're paying tribute to Trevor Young, drummer, of course, with uh, many bands, but uh, mainly I think you'd say uh, Lobby Lloyd and the Coloured Balls. And uh, our next guest, it's a bit like a panel tonight. Our next guest, of course, needs no introduction from Black Feather, Mr. Neil Johns. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, now, we're going to jump over to Den because uh, even though you went to school, you didn't, you didn't see Trev for quite a while, but then you ended up coming together in a band with my friend and your friend, well, everyone's friend, Angry Anderson. So tell us about that. Uh, bumped into Trevor somehow, somewhere, and, um, and we sort of looked at each other and vibed and all the rest of it, and we had a rave, which Trevor was great for, you know, one of Trevor Raves, Trevor's Raves, which uh, uh, I think are legendary. <laughs> but, um, and uh, it, to cut a long story short, I've said that twice and I'm still talking, um, he got me into Buster Brown and we, uh, uh, I think it was basically to fulfil uh, the commitments that that band had, had left after their two guitarists had, had left, so they were in a bit of turmoil. And that went for about six months. And... Um, it was a great experience for a young bloke like me and uh, especially, I think, uh, in a way to, uh, to get into a sort of a bit of a name band and um, they had a bit of a name and uh, to play with Trevor too because I'd, I'd seen him, like I said before, in Black Sea's Babies but I also saw him one night at uh, Sebastian's and he was playing with a band called Highway. Mm. And they, they were fantastic. They were just this beautiful... Uh, pop rock band from New Zealand and Trevor, they, Trevor got the gig and he just put the icing on that cake and I saw him at Sebastian's one night and he just blew me away and for me to be playing with this guy uh, it, was, it was a huge thing for me, you know, just to be playing with Trevor, my old schoolmate yep. and that's it uh, Buster Brown, like we were there for six months and then it was over But I, I, I met him back in the uh, early 70s um, through Angry, and I can't quite remember where, and Trevor couldn't remember either, <laughs> um, because we did talk about it, but we sort of met, and our paths kept crossing all the time, and then I didn't see him again till about 1996, um, and uh, Mick O'Connor, the Reverend Mick O'Connor, said, um, Trevor Young's looking for you, he wants somebody in the computer industry, and I was um, writing music for Nintendo, games at the time and working for a computer company so um, what did he want you for Gab? he wanted programmers because he got involved with some people who were developing an ergonomic mouse and he wanted programmers to write the code for it so um, we hooked up again and went out and had lunch and organized people for him eventually the thing went pear-shaped and didn't eventuate or the people who had it sold it to somebody else which is invariably what happens and then he went on to do his seasons of change um section project yeah. project yeah so was that sort of leading up to that yes yes he because he got involved with the internet and computers and stuff and so that that was the um the instigator of the the Seasons of Change project where he wanted to bring uh, Australian artists out into the world and, and showcase what talent we have here in the country. So this was a side of him that not many people knew about no, at this stage? No, and, and he was very computer literate um, in, in the usage of them. He'd, he'd, he'd done quite a lot. But, he, but uh, that was a part of his character, wasn't it? Yes, he, 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 he was. He, he was enterprising. Uh, yes, you know. He, he, but he was he, also he, a very private. He person. used to take on projects, and he used to like try and kick goals and get people involved, and he was positive. Oh, absolutely. And um, he, he always had some sort of thing on the go. Oh, always. You know? always. And, and that, that was one of his attractive part of his personality, uh, which was you know vibrant and uh, you know enthusiastic and inspirational. You know, oh, and, it, and it spilled over into his music too. It did. Yeah. Neil, of course. Yes. You had many experiences with Trevor. Yeah, well, um, I first met Trevor 
well, it probably wasn't the first time I met him because it was a bit like that back then. You met people and forgot. <clears throat> but Trevor came in after, not long after the situation of um, Gil playing drums on Bob and the Blues with Gil Matthews, which is kind of intriguing in itself because the drummer wasn't there. And then and that Trevor took that, that position uh, for, for a short period of time and then funnily enough came returned again because... Uh, we did a few uh, rehash sort of tours with uh, with the keyboard player and that, and we got the band back together with just a just a piano lineup, and uh, and Trevor played in that as well. I mean, Trevor was always the thing I liked about Trevor from a singer's point of view is Trevor Trevor had a way of um, uh, interconnecting with what was happening vocally as well because we used to have a sort of a a thing going on, um, and Trevor quite often did syncopated things and and off time, and it was great with vocals, so you could interact. With uh, with with fills and things like that, and and um, and and do and do chops together, which was a kind of and Trevor, yeah, he was Trevor was always fun. I mean, Trevor was was non wasn't it? he was nonstop. Trevor was nonstop. He was like the he was you know all the time. yeah yeah. But I think we all were. I, look, that was the thing. I think the period it was a great period for Trevor because those particular periods where a lot of us got on stage and and basically made it up. And I think that was an yeah. intriguing thing for a lot of people because. Um, I think it was, um, this is going to be a really sort of rash thing to say, but I think it was hard from a singer's point of view because you had to create a chorus and, and, and that you say you had to sort of make something up. It wasn't just making up gobbledygook. You had to create something so when, when the, you thought, oh, that'll, that sounds like a good chorus. So, <laughs> so I'll have to remember that when we and get to that part again. And, and, you and, and, and those songs went well, on forever as well, didn't they? I yeah, mean, yeah. That, as long as you like. There was no... Yeah. There was, was no such was like thing that. as a yeah. three-minute song. No, so no. And no, there wasn't. I, no, what, there, was, there was 30 minutes. <laughs> that, I that's three what minute I was songs. remembering. And I also, um, I, I think recently I, I read, um, it was the Bon Scott. He didn't write it. It was a, a, a story on Bon Scott. But saying that uh, uh, Lobby, uh, Lobby's band and, and the bands that were playing around the time, yeah, yeah. Uh, you guys, actually invented... The end of the song, the end of the song could actually go for 20 minutes. Yeah, that's right. That was the end yeah. of the song. That was right. Yeah. <laughs> and, it was, and it was interchangeable. It was changeable. <laughs> but even, look, that's the funny thing. I mean, even, that's the great thing. I mean, someone like Trevor, it was perfect, perfect environment, perfect environment for most players because you were creating constantly on the spot. So it was a great thing, you know. I mean, people would think it was undisciplined. It, look, it was, in some respects, it was undisciplined, but the reality was it, it sounded great. And if it sounded great, then it was okay. Well, he, um, he, he, still, <laughs> he was still doing it. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. It, he, he played that way. Yeah. You know, it was like an um, improvisational thing all the time. It's the way to play. You know. That was the great thing. That was the great thing about... Oh, look, I mean, look, after Blackfeather, there was a, a lineup. There was a band that probably no one really knew about. And we copped a bit of flack because we were called a boogie band, which I thought was really disrespectful in what we were actually doing anyway. And that was Claude Rains. And that was with Brendan Mason on guitar and Kerry McKenna on bass. And that was a hot band. Yeah, great you know? lineup. And, yeah. and we did all new songs. And, and um, I think we were just a bit ahead of what was going on. I think that was really the problem. And that's what that band was all about. It was creating... They were written songs, but the flexibility was always there to, to go wherever you wished. But the core of the song was always there, and that's why it was a great, it, it was a great inventive band. You know. My much older brother Frank, <laughs> who turned me on to the coloured balls. Hello, Frank. How we doing? So, what do you reckon? What's it like for you tonight? Because you're a big fan of the coloured balls and the loss of Trevor Young. Yeah, very sad. Um been a big Colour Balls fan. I was a Lobby fan first. Saw him way back in the, the day with um, Purple Hearts, Wild Cherries. I um, remember being at Sunbury and they came on at um, four in the morning. Uh, it just blew me away. Yep, wonderful. Great times. Do you remember the Sharpie dance? I do, but I can't do it anymore. Come on. No, the Come joints on. have all gone. Just the hands. Come on. Just the hands. Just the hands. Liberate from. <laughs> Over and out. <laughs> Welcome back to Rockdown. My next guest on the uh, Trevor Young tribute tonight is a man that uh, probably knew him as well as anyone ever did because he was the bass player in the Coloured Balls. Would you please welcome 
Gavin Carroll. Thank you, thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Well, I don't know. Let's just start. How how did it all happen? You were the loudest band, the loudest band in Australia. Although I think there was controversy. Billy Thorpe thought he was the loudest. Well, poor old Bill thought he was the loudest, but poor old by Bill. far um, we were the louder. There was no no two ways about it. Um, he just had better marketing. It's the same beta VHS. You know, beta was a better format, but VHS had better marketing. Bill Thorpe had better marketing than the beta band Lobby Lloyd and the Coloured Balls. Simple. So is this constant rivalry? Well, wasn't there? I can tell you there was the, the rivalry even extended to the long way to the top tour where backstage they said, what do you want for gear? And people were coming out with two two cabs with four tens and also I said I want two fridges that's the uh, two eight ten boxes that you can see there at the back I had two of those and uh, an Ampeg SVT 300 watt valve that goes down to two ohms etc etc yeah. so I had that and that was fine now Paul Wheeler at that stage from the Aztecs had won by the by the second show of long way to the top Paul Wheeler had four <laughs> And Bill Thorpe gave the crew backstage express orders not to give me four. <laughs> so I was only allowed to have two and Paul Wheeler had to have four. So and what did you do? Well, I just kept cranking it up louder and louder and louder until you couldn't go any louder anyway. But uh, the thing also then, Lob had four Marshall stacks. And at the start of the long way to the top, Bill had two. Second show, Bill had four. And Lobby kept, had four. Lobby had four, so Bill had to have four Marshall stacks. And Who it just won? went on and on and on. Who won? I think, uh, I think Mike Clark, the sound guy, was uh, a little bit, uh, you know, 30 pieces of silver um, for Bill Thorpe because uh, you could hear it really crank up when Bill Thorpe was on and it's almost like crickets when we were on, you know. <laughs> it's true. So then... <laughs> How was the vibe backstage when you knew this was going on? Uh, it, was, it was a bit intense and, and Bill Thorpe and I knocked heads a few times about it. But Tell uh, us about that. You said that you <laughs> always, you were the only person that really, really stood up to Bill. Yeah, well, everybody accepted that Bill was the control freak and the, um, the sort of the boss and the head honcho and all that. And I thought, no, no. No, I'm the superstar here. <laughs> you know, everybody knows Bill Thorpe, nobody knows Gavin Carroll, but nevertheless, I'm the superstar. But uh, so I, I was always just in his face, always in his face about the, about his levels, about where he wanted us to stand, about he wanted us to do this, he wanted us to say, no, no, we're going to do what we want to do. And, and we were just always at loggerheads, always, always. And I've got some great photos, I should have actually brought them so we could have put them up of Bill and I, every gig there's a photo where Bill and I were together of us arguing. Every gig, I've got photos of it. But the funny thing is that Lobb's benefit at the, um, the palace, I don't know if anybody went to that, yeah? Um, at the end of the night, Bill also gave me a couple of uh, chocolate cakes that didn't turn out to be chocolate cakes. Um, and I, I, I've never taken drugs in my life until that night. Now I know what hash is like. Um, because they gave me these cookies and I'm sitting on the step and I swear to you, the room went out of square. It really did. It looked like the Animoga pub. You know, it, it, it went out of square. But at the end of that night, Bill Thorpe came, made a beeline for me and gave me a big hug and said, love you, man. And I thought, wow, what's this? And then, of course, the next phone call I get is Bill Thorpe has died. So imagine how I felt. But uh, it took 20-odd years for us to become best mates. But I suppose it's great that the last thing that ever happened was Bill and I became best mates. <laughs> but <laughs> as far as drummers are concerned, uh, anybody that knows me knows that I go through drummers like people go through um, breakfast every day. You know, I go through drummers every day because you can either play or you can't play. And if you can't play, get off my stage. Full stop. <laughs> and being a bass player, you've got to be on the money. And there was never a drummer, really, that I played with ever that was on the money like Trevor. Never. Oh, it, it, he was just rock solid. He was just the epitome of a rock solid rock and roll drummer. 
I mean, when he laid it down, you knew where you were every time. He was great. He was fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the the whole band, the band as as a, as a whole, because because Lob is a personality himself. Oh, Lob was, was fantastic. Um, yeah. how did the dynamic work out? Because you you are you don't mince words. No, I don't. And and <laughs> uh, right from the word go, uh, Lob sort of. Because I, I first met up with them when I was in my early 20s and joined up with uh, Lob and them. And right from the word go, Lob took me under his wing because I was just an angry little shit um, that thought, you know, I was it in a bit. I was the best thing since sliced bread. And uh, if anybody got in my way, I'd start yelling and screaming and, and even having fights and things. And Lob would pull me aside and just say, I think you might be just going a little bit far there, bud. <laughs> you know, and, and just pull me aside and pull me into line. And then Trev came along and, and Trev, Trev more so than Bobsy or Lob, didn't take any crap from anybody. Really, he didn't. And uh, when Trev got angry, you, you sort of knew you, you had to sort of toe the line or this guy could probably kill you. Because he was sort of such a nice, nice, gentle sort of person, but you knew he had this side that would just break your back if you got on his bad side. So Trev and I got along famously after that, really, just purely and simply because we had this total respect for one another. And I grew up. <laughs> so that, that's all that had to happen. I just had to grow up. But um, the dynamics of the band were always really interesting because, yes, I didn't mince words, and yes, I wanted to uh, really power the band along. Uh, Lob was always happy to just uh, go with the flow because anything he played was magic anyway. So he just played and everybody just sort of followed Lob. More often than not, we had to actually follow Lob because he'd forgotten where he was and he'd go on to a different song. <laughs> uh, it's it's on, on record. You know, the, 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 the songs that started one way just went into a different direction, but we managed to keep up with him. Um, Bobsy was always just the, the smiling, great, guy that uh, kept everybody happy and it was We're just about Bobsy, Miller. Bobsy Miller yeah who couldn't be here today sorry sorry Trev um, he couldn't be here today because he's got family business and, and he lives in uh, Meetung which is like four and a half hour drive or something so he couldn't be here but uh, the dynamic of the band was actually it was probably all the individual personalities that made the band such a good band to be in Aaron Chembry what do you? What does it mean to you, Trevor Young, and his music? Uh, you know, I've just I've I've learnt a lot, lot of guys that I've played with, and you know, even Gavin really pushed the coloured balls onto me, and um, just the way he played was just phenomenal, yeah. and he could hit hard. Yeah. I remember we we played at the Noise Bar, one thing with Neil Johns and and Trevor on drums, and <laughs> he hit the thing so hard. I remember seeing the tip of the drumstick fly off, and it was just. I've never seen it before, and I think I don't think I'll ever it will, ever will. No, play hard or go home. He was exactly, wasn't he? Hey? exactly, yeah. and he certainly did. What was you know? one one word you reckon to describe Trevor Young? Powerhouse. Powerhouse. <laughs> I think that's the best way to describe it. Yeah. You know, Good. just the way he played. Even his personality was just really nice guy. Yeah. You know, Good human just, being. Yeah, big time. And I found Ronnie here at Music Land celebrating Trevor Young's life. Now, this would have to be one of the biggest fans of Trevor Young. Have a look what he's got. Look at this photo. Hold it up. Now, Ronnie, tell me what um, this means to you to be here tonight celebrating his life. Well, I, I remember going to the Rainbow you know, Hotel um, eight years ago or so, and um, I saw a, a line-up of Black Feather with, with Trevor playing the drum, and I just loved, loved, the, loved the gig. You know, I used to love going to see all these guys, you know, that were big a few years ago, and um, I had the pleasure of seeing Trevor, you know, with the coloured balls and with Black Feather, and um, I enjoyed every minute of it. What about just one word to describe Trevor? Well... A good honest bloke as far as you know as much as i remember him and that very good very good bloke and he was easy to talk to yeah honest hey yeah, yeah. great bloke yeah Rock down. and i found possum in the audience and he's going to tell me what he thinks about trevor young one good memory yeah um 
just being involved with the uh, the boys from the Coloured Balls. It was you know one of the great bands of, of Australian um, rock and roll. Everything they were right into the whole lot, and so was I with them. You know, it was great stuff. And it's a shame that uh, Trevor and a lot of others are the sort of going from uh, uh, our uh, area there. We, we landed a living, and uh, but I'm sure they're all going to have a great time on the other side, wherever they are. And uh, man, what a band that'll be, though. Right? And I found Peter Hood in the audience, and I think he knows a thing or two about the coloured balls and Aussie music in general. What do you got to say about Trev? Uh, oh, look, I really just love Trevor as. I suppose the best way to describe Trevor was he was a rock dog, a memory that will stay with me probably till the day I die. Hope it's not tomorrow. Better not be. Uh, is um, at the end of the, his last gig, to my knowledge, he came up to me at the end of the night and it was in Bendigo. And I went to shake his hand, said, oh, like I always did, thanks Trevor, great show, yeah. catch you next time. And uh, he put his arms around me and he hugged me and he, and he said mate thanks for the support thanks for being here and that was trevor young Me. welcome back to rock down it's our tribute to trevor young drummer with uh, of course the colored balls and of, of course played in many many bands but two of his good friends from the one and only matter lake would you please welcome brendan mason and kerry mckenna thank you Now, you boys were actually uh, good friends. Absolutely. Um, Trevor was more than just a drummer to me. Uh, <laughs> the whole persona of Trev extended across an incredible spectrum. Um, when I first met Trev, uh, it was in the early 70s, and uh, he was in uh, Coloured Balls, who were the absolute opposite end of the world to Matter Lake. Mm. Coloured balls were the, were the skinheads and they were pretty heavy. Matter Lake, we were just dreaming. Hippies. We yeah, it was years. lovely. So basically, uh, at that stage, there was a jean company called Emco Jeans. And Je Emco started to, to do a whole lot of road shows, obviously, to promote their jeans. And how they set this up was with rock and roll bands. And uh, Coloured Balls and Matter Lake were, were part of this concert theory to promote Amco jeans and uh, I remember one day and it's either Coburg or North could drive in on a really hot day and Matter Lake and, and Coloured Balls were either side by side they played before us or we played before them. So Anyhow, what, sort of what sort of crowd did you attract? Well this happened actually continually and I think we, we often wondered whether or not it was a bit of a joke by the agencies to put Matter Lake and, and Coloured Balls together because quite often we'd play gigs and one side of the hall would be all skinheads and the other side would be all hippies. But they coexisted great. But sharpies, anyhow, someone's yelling out Sharpies. Yeah, good on the Sharpies. They were great. Well, yeah. Hey? You got it. Yeah, thank you. So anyhow, Coloured Balls had been on first or Matter Lake had been on first and we finished and Trev and I were backstage and we kind of knew of each other, but we'd never had much to do with each other. And one of the two of us said, how about we go and have a look around this place? From that moment on, Ke Trev and I got on like a house on fire. We were opposite ends of the world, but we really had a great friendship. And we kept crossing paths through the years. And then it was later on that we had a, there was a party at Neil's place. And uh, we put in, or we implemented the idea of... of Are you uh, talking about Neil Johns? Yeah, Neil yeah. Johns uh, and Kerry. And Kerry. My long-term friend. Yes. Um, we put together what we termed as probably one of Australia's early supergroups, which was Matter Lake, Black Feather and Coloured Balls. And that was Claude Rains. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Good band. That was, that was a wonderful experience. Uh, first off, having a, a singer like Neil... And then having a pa and then my mate here that I knew backwards anyway we'd been together since we were 15 years old, and uh, then having this powerhouse of a drummer, and uh, and I always describe to people Trev was like having the energy force of about 20 people. Uh, you definitely knew when Trev came into the room, and uh, and I always joke to people that 
you could pretty well write a lullaby and Trev would make it into a high-powered rock and roll song. <laughs> but uh, there was a really soft side to Trev that uh, a lot of people didn't see. And uh, because he was so brash and outspoken and, and so in your face, he, he would honestly freak a lot of people out. But I saw the soft side of Trev and uh, he was a wonderful human being. There was some times where I had a few personal issues and Trev was a, just a fantastic mentor to, to, to give me new perspective on how to look at a problem. And he did that with a lot of people. He, uh, he helped a lot of young kids. He worked on a council and did some terrific work with the council. And there was a lot of extracurricular things that Trev did involve himself with that uh, a lot of people didn't know about. And I applaud him for that. He was a wonderful person. Yeah. Yeah. I hand you over to Kerry. Yeah. Kerry. I remember one of his favourite uh, sayings was, forget who you think you are and get on with being who you are. And it was just a great thing. And he did have the energy of ten men. I remember 20. him dancing in the car seat all the way to Geelong. He just wouldn't keep still. It just fascinated me. He was just bursting with energy. And he was just like that naturally. Oh, yeah, all the time. All sort of naturally. All the time. <laughs> And one of the greatest drummers I ever played with. He was just so powerful. It was He'd bend the drums. Uh, I think Des McKenna said he'd actually not just break sticks and break uh, skins, he'd actually bend the whole drum. <laughs> Which Who was his sponsor? <laughs> yeah, he was his sponsor. Oh, actually, Zildjian yeah, was a, yeah, true, a yeah. sponsor, but he broke so many symbols they took the sponsorship <laughs> off him. <laughs> Yeah, and I remember he got, one of the things that impressed me, um, ACDC wanted him to join at one stage, and he lined up Phil Rudd for the gig because he couldn't do it. So Phil Rudd was always indebted greatly to Trev. Trev, yeah. ha Trev had an amazing ability to feel through a song. He could, he could not, he didn't particularly like rehearsing, but he had an incredible talent for being able to listen, interpret, and then the thing that I thought was, was a wonderful thing when we played with Trev is how he could resolve a song and bring it home. And boy, could he bring it home hard. It was great. So he would drive the band? Always. I mean, when, you know when you say drive a band, like basically you've got your bass and drums, which is the... Yep. Mm. The foundations. That's the foundations. You can't do anything without that. And it's got to be solid. Um, but then as far as... We're talking about coming back into the chorus, going to a solo. Mm. It was so terrific like that. He could, he, he, he so he was driving it rather than, say, the guitarist saying, well, I'm going to finish now. I, I, I think he worked, he, he worked together with everybody with that. He could read it so well that, you know, uh, especially in Claude. And Claude Rains is probably the, the one that I can liken it to the most, that it was, we, we'd written all the music, we'd started playing it, and, and as all original music does after you've written it, it starts to evolve, and there were some terrific pieces that, that, that uh, we involved ourselves with the Trev. He, um, he, he uh, had a, there was one particular time, just digressing a little bit, which is a, a, one of my favourite stories about Trev, is Trev had the reputation of being an incredibly loud drummer. One of Trev's favourite things to do at Soundcheck, a lot of drummers when they're at Soundcheck will do the wah ba da ba da ba da ba da ba da Trev would just wait for an opportune moment when a lot of people's heads were down, and I'll move the mic away, and he'd just go, what? With a snare drum, and it was insane. He would put people up on the roof. <laughs> it was so loud. Anyhow, we did this gig one time, and we had the reputation that we've got a really loud drummer. Anyhow, we started playing, and the manager of the, of the particular venue was a little bit against the fact that we were so loud. We were trying our hardest to bring it down and to try and pull Trev down. And we had a situation where it was a pretty small gig, so we only had it like a vocal PA, which was right behind us. Now, I've never seen anything more incredible out of a drummer in my life, but Trev described to me later on that when he's playing, he hits so hard that quite often he'll break a stick. Now, he said to me that if I'm on the downstroke, I'll drop the stick, if I'm on the upstroke, it'll go straight over my head. He broke a stick and it was on the upstroke 
and he flicked it over his head and managed to find the button on the mixer that turned the mixer <laughs> on to, to absolute turbo screaming feedback. Just about pinned the whole org or audience to the back wall. And do you reckon we could find that button? No. <laughs> you could sit there for the rest of your life with a drumstick and go, Donk, nah, missed again, another <laughs> drumstick. One shot. It was fantastic. <laughs> he hit it. He hit it. It was great. <laughs> But that's the talent of Trevor Young. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, to Trevor Young, Val. On you, Trev. Love ya. And now we're going to have music. Yay! Don and Phil. Why, well, thank you. Johnny is a joker. He's a bird, a very funny joker. He's a bird, when he jokes my honey. He's a dog, he's joking, he's a funny. What a dog. Johnny is a joker that's trying to steal my baby. He's a bird dog. Johnny sings a love song like a bird. He sings the sweetest love song you ever heard. When he sings to my gal, what a hell. To me, he's just a wolf dog on the prowl. Johnny wants to fly away and puppy love my baby. He's a bird dog. Hey, bird dog, get away from my quail. Hey, bird dog, you're on the wrong trail. Bird dog, you better leave my lovey dove alone. Check. Hey, bird dog, you better get away quick. Bird dog, you better find a chicken and love of your own. Johnny kissed the teacher. He's a bird. He tiptoed up to reach her. He's a bird. He's the teacher's pet now. What a hell. What he wants, he can get now. What a hell. He even made the teacher let him sing next to my baby. He's a bird dog. Hey, bird dog, get away from my quail. Hey, bird dog, you're on the wrong trail. Bird dog, you better leave my lovey dove alone. Hey, bird dog, get away from my chick. Hey, bird dog, you better get away quick. Bird dog, you better find a chicken and a love of your own. He's a bird. He's a dog. He's a bird dog.
the joke's on Thank you. 